My name's Sharon Marie Weldon and I'm a reader in nursing, research and education. Uh, it's a joint appointment at the University of Greenwich and Bart's Health. And my colleague here is um, Miranda Cromfley, who is a research associate at Imperial College London in clinical education. Now, the project we're going to talk about today was actually when we were part of the Imperial College Centre for Engagement and Simulation Science, which is led by Professor Roger Kneebone and Fernando Bello. Um, and essentially, our role within that group was to develop and research innovative forms of simulation. So what we're going to talk to you today about is a particular type of um, uh, simulation called sequential simulation. Have any of you heard of it before? Put your hands up, just so I can keep it. Okay, that's good. So I think word's getting out there, and it's been around a few years. We've been um, researching it for probably about seven years, um, and we've been applying it to... It's quite broad, and I'll talk a bit more about what it is, but we've been applying it to many different projects. And this end-of-life care project was a collaboration with Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, who had a need, and they came to us, and we helped them design the sequential simulation to meet their objectives, but also we researched it. So what we're going to present once we have the slides here is what we did and kind of a brief overview of some of the results of the research. We won't go into too much detail because it's quite complex. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get some slides in a second. Excellent, thank you. So yeah, so this is, um, as I've gone through all the other stuff, but this is a multidisciplinary training program for end-of-life care based on a sequential simulation design. And I'm gonna pass you over to Miranda who's gonna provide the context for where this project came about. So a little bit of um, background to the course. Um, we know from the literature that end-of-life care training in hospitals isn't perfect. And we also know there's an evidence base for a need um, to support uh, multi-professional staff from all disciplines and all specialty areas um, to further develop their skills to provide good life, end-of-life care. Um, and at the bottom here, these, these, kind of, these two pieces of evidence are really, really closely linked um, because actually we know that um, it's a kind of endless, endless challenge for palliative care teams, this, this kind of educational role. Um, in the edu uh, palliative care teams can't be primarily responsible for the care of all dying patients with that expertise. So it's really crucial to be able to provide a way to um, pass that expertise on and, and support um, frontline staff from all disciplines um, to further develop their, their skills to provide good end of life care. Um, in particular, in the trust um, where this programme uh, took place, there had recently been a training needs analysis, um, which had identified from data, both from patient surveys and from staff surveys, a specific need to support staff um, in the trust to further develop their, their skills. And that's, that's staff from all different specialty areas, medicine, surgery across the hospital, and at all, from all different disciplines. So medicine, nursing, therapy, or all the different backgrounds. So that's, that's the rationale um, that the course design was based on. So why use simulation? Well, I think it was felt by the team, um, the palliative care team at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, that it, it bridges that gap, as you, and you know, I don't need to tell most of you here, but between theory and practice. But I think the other element was that because of end, the complexities of end-of-life care, there was that need to bring everyone together and there was a lot of communication involved and forward thinking, and it was felt that simulation could provide that. Um, the reason why the sequential simulation was identified was mainly because what sequential simulation does is it thinks about the longitudinal elements of care it actually places the, the patient at the center. So whereas usually we design simulations based on our workplaces, our specialities and our training needs, sequential simulation kind of thinks about the journey that the patient's going through. And for end of life care, that's really important because what we often miss is we only see the patient at a certain point in their journey. And those, those points don't always connect up to give the best outcome for the patient. So really it was a kind of time factor that was crucial here, that was really important, that we could simulate a period before the end of that patient's life and look at how we could change what would happen or how we could discuss the changes to um, how the end of life comes about. Um, so essentially we had our, our learning outcomes from the training needs analysis. Um, and the sequential simulation model enabled us to have a really goal-oriented approach to use those learning outcomes to inform the entire course. So to inform uh, the course structure, to inform the design of the scenarios, um, to inform the briefing that was given to the actors and the educators, and also to inform the debrief. 
Um, so we had 57 healthcare professionals from different backgrounds attend seven um, half-day courses over, th over three months. And those seven courses were specifically designed um, to be targeted or tailored to staff from particular specialty areas. Um, the staff were originally identified that hopefully they would attend as discrete teams, um, actually when it came to availability on the day and so on. Obviously, you're all aware of how difficult it is to provide training for staff when they're coming out of clinical duties. Um, so we, we, ha we ended up with the right disciplinary mixes, but not necessarily staff that were always working in, in discrete teams together. Um, but the, the courses were targeted to staff from particular areas like gastroenterology, like stroke, like respiratory, like surgery, to kind of attend as teams and, and to have these kind of these, these tailored scenarios, which were specially designed in collaboration with clinician, <laughs> clinicians from those areas. And the other component, just going back to that kind of multi-professional mix of frontline staff, was that we did have multi-professional faculty from palliative care teams uh, represented in order to support that sort of authentic approach to, to multi-professional learning. So yeah, this is just um, showing you um, the mix of um, the participants who attended. I think um, what I should say as well before we move forward is part of the problem with sequential simulation, as you're probably already realising, is the complexity of it. There's so much you could think about in a patient's journey and where, where do you start and what do you frame? And what we have developed is um, a model that's empirically and theoretically driven and it helps people to think about those and think about what's needed to be framed and in relation to the objectives. Um, so that's one thing that we did use with this particular project, which made it easier to design. And actually, if you're interested in the design of it, we are doing a workshop after lunchtime on that. Um, so for this particular project, the design, so the pathway was separated into segments of time. It was a six-day admission for the patient. And it was speciality specific for each um, speciality, as Miranda said. And over that six day period, we separated it into three sessions, three scenarios. So three sequential scenarios, which I'll go through in more detail. The participants, the teams as well, were also sp split up into two multidisciplinary teams. Um, and then both teams to start off with were required to read the patient's notes in separate rooms and make a care plan together, but separately. So within their team, but separate to the other team. And then team one was asked to go in and consult the patient on day two, and team two would watch in another room. And then on day six, team two would go in and consult the patient, although things would have changed in the scenario, the progression, and the um, team one would watch. So kind of giving you a bit more of a visual cue of how this looked. So this is scene one, scenario one. Um, these are both teams split up and they're in different rooms with the same patient notes um, looking at what's going on. The patient's just been admitted and they're making a care plan there. And then we had um, a bit of a pre-brief before we went into the scenarios and we also um, emphasised that time transi transition. So now we're going into day, day two. So it's really important with sequential simulation that everyone's clear about where you are in the pathway. That's often where the complexity comes about. We then ended up in scene two, and you can see here um, on the bottom left picture, you have the first clinical team in, and they're meeting with the patient for the first time, and they're discussing um, how they will move forward. And then you have team two who are watching this, and probably quite frustra frustrating at some point, because they, they probably made slightly different care plans, or I think they did in some of the scenarios, and so they're watching, but interesting, because they're watching to see how it would be done differently, something they wouldn't always see. Then come back and have a debrief and talk about that, and you know what they would have done differently, what they liked, what they didn't, and many other things. And then emphasize that transition. Well, it's now day six, and we want you to swap round, and we want team one to sit and watch team two go in. But obviously, team two are very much aware that a care plan's already been started, changes have happened, and they have to go in based on that. And that's quite, that's very realistic in real life. So it worked quite well for them in that sense that it might be frustrating for them, but it's how it would be. Um, and then there was a final debrief to discuss, you know, this and what happened. So from a research perspective, what we were interested in was helping the design of it, but also being quite an innovative way of using the sequential simulation. We were looking at it in different ways. And we did a mixed method study. We collected lots of data. We had video recordings of the sim and the debriefs. We had pre and post questionnaires. We actually um, came from 
we looked at confidence levels essentially. We wanted to see will this intervention within this short three and a half hour, thank you, short three and a half hour time um, make a difference to all the clinicians' confidence in making end of life care plans and decisions. And then we also had open ended questions, evaluative questions, and we asked for th um, reflective accounts three to six months later after the simulation training. And we analysed it in lots of different ways. I won't go into all the details, um, but both quantitatively and qualitatively. And I'll just talk a little bit about a, just a small element of the results. So we're still analysing certain parts of the data. It was quite complex. There's lots of things to look at. But I'm going to talk about something that we found quite interesting, and there might be something more to pursue there. But essentially, what we did get back, which was um, promising, was that the, the overall cohort was statistically, it was statistically significant that they had increased confidence pre and post. So we match paired this analysis. We got their, um, how confident they felt before. And then afterwards, we found out based on this validated measure. We then decided to look at the cohorts differently across the professions. And as you can see here, unfortunately, we don't have the power for the therapists and nurses to really say this is really meaningful because there wasn't enough in terms of numbers. We do for the doctors, but the doctors, it was highly significant still. Therapists, significant, and the nurses, not at all. And we were quite interested thinking, does this have any meaning that the qualitative data could answer? So we actually used um, the, the results from the quantitative analysis to create this explanatory framework where we could essentially kind of code the qualitative data. So everything they'd written down about the course and how they felt about it within the questionnaire. And interestingly, there was something coming out from the doctors that we weren't seeing with the nurses and therapists. It was kind of like um, a, something extra they got from the course that seemed really important to them. And I'm just going to kind of um, show you some of this. So we had a consultant saying the debrief and watching others manage communication. That's what was important to them. Very useful having the views of the MDT members as well as actors' perspectives. Oh, we had a simulated patient as well, I should have said, um, as very often medically led. The ability to discuss amongst colleagues your own difficulties and hearing others. Ability to discuss my fears of situations that arise that I don't normally discuss. And this one, which is really nice, have not had the opportunity to reflect on the most common serious conversation I have as a professional for many years. Now, we didn't see this for many of the other professions. And like I say, numbers wise, I don't know if we can say this has any meaning, but it was certainly something interesting and that we'd like to pursue. And maybe on a longer term basis, the reflective accounts might be able to show us something as well. So I guess overall within this study, we felt that this sequential simulation was a unique approach to looking at end of life care and something that was probably quite appropriate in this setting. Um, it was if we felt that the confidence was increased and we hope that when we analyze the reflective accounts that will show on a longer term. And yes, of course, we'd like it to be replicated really in future studies to see if it's beneficial. So thank you. <laughs>